So I was, uh, I was conned into giving this lecture um, as part of the Emmy Netter Day. Um, not because this is something I do for my research, but because uh, you know, I happen to teach uh, Netter's theorem to uh, second year students. Uh, anyone here who took the class with me? And Okay, good, so I have support in the audience. Uh, <laughs> And so, um, but I, I hope that most of you are mathematicians and maybe, maybe even someone here has never seen Netter's theorem and how it's being proved. Uh, so I hope this will be worthwhile. Um, so the plan of my talk is uh, to uh, maybe spend a third of the time that I have to try to um, emphasize as much as I can how important symmetry is in physics. Uh, and then another third of the talk to emphasize how important conservation laws are in physics. And then, hopefully, I'll have time for, in the third part of the talk uh, to describe and prove you know, the way ma uh, physicists prove theorems, not the way mathematicians prove, uh, but prove this uh, amazing theorem uh, published by uh, Emmy Netter in 1918, so also about 100, 100 years ago. Um, basically, essentially, uh, combining the, these two amazing uh, components of physics uh, into one thing, basically saying that if one exists, so does the other, uh, one implies the other, uh, and there's a very, very deep connection between the two that uh, I, I, you know, I really want to give you a flavor of, of this and, and why it is so important. Uh, some people uh, would say, and this is definitely uh, uh, my belief as well, is that Netter's theorem is probably one of the most important statements in physics, uh, if not the most important one. So, you know, symmetry uh, is known to, uh, to uh, everyone, uh, and it, you know, it starts from looking at mirror reflections of objects which seem very uh, aesthetic and beautiful, but of course in science symmetry is much more uh, than that. Um, and I don't know why I associate this definition with uh, Hermann Weyl, but uh, this is a definition um, that is good to start with, which says that an object has symmetry uh, if there's something that you can do to it, after which you cannot tell that it was done. Okay, so uh, this is an object which is invariant and there's some kind of a transformation, uh, and, and, and as such it has symmetry. And so, of course, we enlarge uh, the notion of symmetry much, much beyond just mirror reflections. Uh, and here symmetry operations can be combinations of a, a number of things. For example, the famous yin-yang symbol uh, is not symmetric under mirror reflection. It's not even symmetric under a two-fold rotation. But if you apply two-fold rotation and then permute the two colors, then uh, you wouldn't know that I did this operation, and so it's symmetric under that. And, 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 and we see that all around us, of course. Now. Um, for, for the discussion in this, in this talk, it'd be, it's, it will be important to distinguish between continuous and discrete symmetries. Of course, you all know that symmetries are eventually described uh, using group theory because uh, applications of symmetry operations, uh, one after the other, is like a group mu multiplication. So they form the structure of a group. And so you might, as mathematicians, want to think of these as being continuous and discrete uh, groups. So I have uh, an example from geometry. I have an example from real life uh, and a man-made example. I uh, love this infinite road. Uh, so this is continuous symmetry, and this has a discrete uh, set of translations that uh, leave it invariant. Now, um, combining symmetry and physics, I think the best quote is from uh, Phil Anderson, who said that uh, it is only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. So maybe in the last decade or two, there's a competitor uh, called topology, but I think symmetry still holds uh, the, the grand place in terms of uh, the single most um, uh, um, aspect uh, that we use in order to study physics. And I'd like to tell you uh, three uh, stories uh, related to that. First of all, to describe the so-called principle of symmetry. This is the principle in which we use symmetry to study physical objects. Um, and then explain to you why it always doesn't work. So again, a mathematician friend told me that physicists have no problem proving theorems even though they know there are exceptions to the theorem, <laughs> counterexamples. So this is a good example of that. Um, and then I want to say a few words about the symmetries of the laws of nature itself, which will uh, form the basis of Netter's uh, theorem. So in terms of looking at a symmetry of an experiment, if this is my experiment, 
uh, these scales and I want to predict what is going to happen uh, if I let go of the scale, then clearly this has reflection symmetry. Um, and so because of the symmetry, uh, we really can immediately say in advance that nothing is going to happen. There's no reason for one scale to tip over uh, and, 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 and go you know, in a particular direction that breaks this symmetry. And so the statement of the principle of symmetry, and this probably goes back to the ancients, you know, to the Greeks, uh, basically says that when certain causes produce certain effects, the symmetry elements of the causes must be found in their effects. A very simply stated principle uh, with which we can now uh, you know, design experiments and figure out what's the proper way of uh, performing an experiment. So I want to give a slightly more interesting example. And this is Ersted's experiment uh, performed in 1820, where Ersted had this um, feeling, I don't know where it came from, a gut feeling, that if you run electric currents near a magnetic uh, needle, uh, you will cause some effect on the magnetic needle, okay? So now the needles themselves, I place the magnetic needles, I place them on the table and they just orient themselves according to the magnetic field of Earth. I can't control that. So you see, uh, that's what happened to both of these needles. But I can now orient the direction of the current in two different ways, either along the needle or normal to the needle. Now if I look at this experiment, and, and if you know the answer, don't, don't, you know, don't ruin it for me. Uh, but let's, let's analyze this in terms of symmetry. So if you look at the right-hand side option, then clearly this resembles the scales here. You know, it has this mirror reflection symmetry. So in this case, the causes are symmetric, and so the outcome must reflect this symmetry. And we expect the needle not to move in this case. But if we look at this, there's no mirror symmetry. You know, we either flip the needle if we put a mirror like this, and we flip the direction of the current if we put uh, the other a mirror, so we don't expect, so there is no symmetry, and so there's no problem for current to tilt the needle. And of course, we can even predict more than that. If we change the direction of the current, we expect the needle to flip in the other direction. Okay, so this is a good assumption. Now, I, I couldn't bring the demonstration here, so I brought this guy to demonstrate. Um, it is in Hebrew. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't understand Hebrew? Don't be shy. Um, essentially, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to perform the experiment in the way that we analyze that we should perform it, and let's see uh, what happens. No, I can't hear anything. For some reason, we can't hear anything, so I'll, 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 I'll just narrate it myself. So you can see that um, you know, the magnetic uh, needle can go only one way. Um, I set the direction of the current to be uh, normal to it, like we saw that we should set it. And I'm going to flip the switch. And I'm very surprised that nothing is happening. So I'm checking the equipment, just to be sure. And you can see the ammeter here. You see the current is going through the wire, and nothing's happening. OK, so so much for the principle of symmetry. Is that uh, what screwed me here? Um, well, the story goes, as far as I know, the historians are not here yet, right? that uh, Ersted tried this experiment many times, and at some point, either him or his assistant um, oriented the current differently. And so I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to reorient the current wire. I talk a little too much here. <laughs> so uh, this is a promo for my uh, lecture series, the, my MOOC, my online course, uh, Basic Notions of Physics. I really am talking a lot. <laughs> So now we're going to reorient the wire. As you can see, now the wire is roughly uh, parallel or along the magnetic needle. Everything else uh, is completely the same. So the same uh, um, current uh, will be run through the wire now. And now as I flip the switch, hopefully soon, <laughs> when I watch it, I do it twice as fast. So. <laughs> OK, here I'm flipping the switch. Finally, <laughs> and you can see the needle, you know, really very dramatically moving when I turn on the current. And if I flip the direction of the current, uh, then I'll see the needle uh, moving in the opposite direction. Okay, so, so what went wrong here? What went wrong here is not a problem with uh, 
the principle of symmetry, but with the way we use the principle of symmetry. And Pierre Curie, many years later, at the, towards the end of the 19th century, knowing about Ersted's experiment, restated the principle of symmetry and said that when certain effects show certain asymmetry, this asymmetry must be found in the causes which gave rise to them. Okay, so I'm sitting with a majority of mathematicians who would tell me that this is silly because if uh, B follows from A, uh, not B uh, basically says that we have not A. This is all I've done here. I've made a logical uh, re, or he made a logical restatement of this principle. But the point is that physics is an experimental science. Physics is not a theoretical science. As much as a theorist, I might like to believe that. It's an experimental science. And before we do an experiment, we don't know what the symmetry uh, of the uh, causes are. All we can do is perform an experiment and maybe use it to infer what the symmetries were. So we saw that in this configuration, the needle actually moved. So for some odd reason, this system, okay, and it doesn't matter what the direction is, for some reason, this system is asymmetric. This system is not symmetric under this mirror reflection that we initially so happily assumed uh, it would be. And, and actually, Ersted realized this point eventually, and he basically noted in his notebook that the magnetism itself in the needle is associated with some rotating uh, object. And so if you flip a rotating object about a mirror, you change the direction of rotation, and you actually flip the magnet. So that mirror flips the magnet uh, as opposed to maybe what we uh, would have uh, imagined. Now, why, what, why doesn't it always work? And the famous uh, um, example for that comes from the 14th century, that's Buridan's ass. Uh, the situation is that you have this ass, this donkey, um, equally spaced uh, from two piles of hay. Now this is a completely symmetric situation and the ass can't decide whether it should go eat the uh, pile of hay on the right or the pile of hay on the left. And the point is, and, and Buridan was a philosopher, so this was actually making fun of his philosophical statement saying that uh, should two courses be judged equal, then the will cannot break the deadlock. All it can do is to suspend judgment until the circumstances change and the right course of action is clear. Okay, and this later made it into political cartoons. Uh, but you know, you ask yourself the question, will uh, the ass really die of hunger? And of course, um, the answer is no. It will have to at some point to decide if he's going to the right or going to the left. In physics, we call this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking is exactly a counterexample to the principle of symmetry. It basically says that even though the causes are symmetric, the effect will spontaneously break that symmetry. And this typically occurs when a stable equilibrium that's depicted by this cartoon, because we change some external parameters, changes to an unstable equilibrium. Now, in a situation like this, noise uh, will eventually, inevitably, cause this ball either to tip to the right or to tip to the left. So some random fluctuations will remove this symmetry, will break the symmetry. Of course, if we perform this experiment many, many, many times, then the overall outcome will be symmetric. Half of the times it'll fall to the right, half of the times it'll fall to the left. But any, in any given experiment, the symmetry will be broken. And this happens, uh, I mean, Euler knew this. Um, there's no stick here, but if you take a stick and you put pressure on it, if you compress it, even though it's completely symmetric, it'll eventually buckle into a particular direction in space uh, and break that symmetry. Um, when we go from a liquid to a solid, we break the continuous translational symmetry of the water in this case uh, into discrete set of translational symmetries of the ice. Uh, when we generate ferromagnets and superfluids and superconductors uh, and all these things go under the Anderson or Higgs mechanism because the Higgs, uh, the, the idea of Higgs is actually uh, a similar idea uh, of this uh, kind of notion of symmetry breaking. And finally, um, you know, this uh, definition of symmetry that we've been using applies to any object. So the object I want to apply this uh, notion now are the laws of nature themselves. And so if I look at a particular law, say, for example, Newton's law of gravity that tells me that the strength of the uh, gravitational uh, uh, pull of two objects 
of mass m1 and m2 uh, is given by this expression. It's proportional to 1 over the separation, uh, uh, the square of the separation between the two objects. So this expression, if I now take my two objects and I translate them in space, without changing the distance between them, this will not affect the strength of the interaction. If I rotate these two objects in space without affecting the distance between them, these are operations that will not affect this object. It will not affect the strength of the interaction. So in that sense, we say that we can associate symmetry operations with the laws of nature themselves. And so, and I'll concentrate on continuous symmetries, there are a number of different things that we can do essentially to all laws of nature uh, which are symmetric, for which they are symmetric. So as I mentioned, translation in space, um, translation in time. So um, apart from you know, very early uh, after the Big Bang, uh, we believe that any experiment that we do now or we shift back in time or we shift forward in time should give us the same uh, results. There's a symmetry in translating in time, um, rotation in space, as I mentioned, and even moving as long as the motion is at a constant velocity. Okay? On the other hand, there are operations that are not symmetries of the laws of nature, so not everything goes. For example, if I rotate at a constant angular velocity, that is not a symmetry of the laws of, nat of, um, of uh, nature, um, moving not at constant velocity, but for example, at a constant acceleration, that is not a symmetry, and rescaling. So taking one experiment and just blowing it up to 10, 10 times its original size, that will also not leave uh, the laws invariant. So if we're in a closed room and we perform these kinds of experiments that are, uh, I'm sorry, if we perform an experiment in a closed room, in a closed room and someone is performing some kind of transformation of this sort to us, we won't be able to feel it. But these kinds of transformations, we will actually be able to physically measure, measure. And one of the uh, first people to describe this and discuss this in detail uh, was no other than uh, Galileo Galilei. <laughs> okay, so I talked about symmetry. I'm almost on time. Uh, now I want to talk a little about conservation laws. So what is a conservation law? Well, it's very easy to uh, show you how I derive uh, a conservation law. If I just, for example, uh, look at the uh, at Newton's second law of motion. Newton's second law of motion tells us how the momentum, P is the momentum, um, of an object changes if we apply a force F to that object. Essentially, application of a force uh, changes uh, the momentum. So looking at this expression, we can immediately conclude that if the force is zero, the change in time of the momentum is zero, so the momentum is a constant uh, quantity. Okay? This is actually Newton's first law of motion, so again, most of us are mathematicians here. Why would you state two laws where one is just a special case of the other? Uh, we do things like that in physics because <laughs> it was a very important point to, 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 to emphasize the fact that a uh, um, body continues to move even if you don't uh, apply any force to it. So the understanding was that you need to keep applying forces on bodies to c cause them to move. Uh, and Galileo actually, again, uh, it's his law of inertia. He's the one who, um, who emphasized that. Another way of saying this is a statement that, you know, these are Newton's laws. So again, you know, these are axioms. We expect them to be always correct. But in fact, it's the first law that tells us when the second law actually is applicable. So if you do an experiment without any forces and you see that momentum doesn't change, you know that you're in a so-called inertial frame of reference. And only when you're in inertial frame of res references does the second law actually apply. Okay? So that's another way of saying that. Now, uh, so I have a conservation law. Uh, this is the law of momentum conservation. Or we generalize this law by using Newton's third law, which says that for every pair of uh, bodies, the force exerted by one on the other has the same magnitude as the force exerted by the second on the first, just with opposite directions. So if I look at the internal forces between particles in a system which has many particles, each one of these forces will cause a change of the momentum to, the, uh, uh, to one of the particles, uh, but exactly with opposite sign. 
So when I add up all these changes, I see that the total momentum uh, will, stay, uh, will stay a constant of the motion. So any constant of the motion like this is a conservation law. Um, OK, one more demonstration. <laughs> uh, this is the demonstration of uh, conservation of momentum. What we're doing here is we have a, a bottle like this. We're compressing air into the bottle. And the idea is, uh, at some point, to let the bottle go and uh, have the air that, going, that goes backward take away some of the momentum in the backward direction, uh, essentially propelling uh, the rocket in the forward direction. Now, that wasn't very impressive. So what we did here is we added some water into the bottle. So now, after the compression, when we let the bottle go, uh, not only air, but also water, which has a much higher mass than air, about a 1,000 times higher, uh, will go uh, backwards. And so hopefully, the bottle will really shoot forward, which is something that he will shortly show you. OK. <laughs> OK, so this is just by increasing the backward momentum, by increasing the mass that goes backward, uh, we can really uh, launch this rocket forward. Uh, the same holds for rotational motion. So I go back to my Newton's equations of motion. And instead of force, I write a torque, which is just the cross product of the position of the particle with the force <laughs> acting on it. And I write the angular momentum, which is the same idea. Uh, we get uh, an equation of this form for the second law. And again, if the torque is 0, then the angular momentum is conserved. Or if I have a system of many particles, if the external torque on the system is 0, then the total angular momentum of the system is conserved. But of course, we, we know about the conservation of charge, of electric charge. And so we really need to also consider these kinds of conservation laws. So not only functions of the dynamic variables of the system, like the position and the momentum, but also, for example, the electronic charge of the particles from which my system is composed. And it was Benjamin Franklin and a few others um, in, in the middle of the 18th century that realized empirically, and look what he says, it is now discovered and demonstrated both here and, and in Europe, no invariant under translation in space, <laughs> that the electrical fire, time and space, I guess, uh, that the electrical fire is a real element or species of matter not created by friction, but collected only. You know, you, you uh, uh, take a, a wool on a piece of, of uh, um, what's it called, uh, amber, and you, you, you generate uh, charge, but you don't really generate the charge. You pull it from one object to the other. Um, second, maybe, of importance is conservation of mass. And this is Antoine Lavoisier, um, probably the father of modern chemistry, who said something very similar in terms of uh, the mass that is conserved in chemical reactions. So the mass before a reaction, the mass after the reaction is exactly the same. All you do is a, you know, make some sort of rearrangement of the uh, atomic constituents of the, of the matter. And then roughly at the same time, also around the 18th century, there was a notion of heat that was similar to electric charge. So there's a caloric charge. This is the charge of heat that you're thinking there's some sort of uh, thermal, um, thermal charge that flows from hot bodies to cold bodies uh, while changing their temperature. Very similar, very analogous to electric charges that flow from one body to another, uh, changing their total uh, electric charge. Now, if we look at hindsight in these, uh, conservations, then this is true and strong and will appear uh, when we discuss uh, Netter's theorem. Mass conservation, we know, is almost correct. It's correct very often, definitely in these chemical reactions. Uh, but when we approach uh, the high velocities, when we approach the uh, 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 point where we have to use uh, um, um, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, then we know that actually mass and energy uh, are related to each other. And this uh, very early on was uh, shown to be incorrect, that uh, heat is not carried by a separate charge which is uh, conserved. So this brings me, of course, to energy conservation. 
And, and this is actually quite an elusive concept, much harder to understand than momentum and angular momentum that I showed you earlier. Uh, I think one of the first people to discuss it in the way we talk about it today uh, was Thomas Young, and so we're already at the beginning of the 19th century. But really the important uh, experiment was done by James Joule, who showed that if you just take water and you kind of um, stir it by this mechanical motion of stirring the water, you can heat the water. So heating an object, uh, you can cause the object to heat up, not by transferring charge to it, but just by doing mechanical work on the charge. And I think it was only towards the end of the 19th century uh, where people like uh, Kelvin uh, you know, thought about all of these notions together and wrote down uh, what is now called the first law of thermodynamics, which is essentially the law of conservation of energy. So the way you can change the internal energy of some system is either by performing work on it or by heating it. So a joule actually established the fact that heating is also a way to transfer energy from one uh, source, uh, from one body to another. Um, but energy itself is always conserved. It is never, uh, never lost, only changes its form from different kinds of energy. So what is a conservation law? Uh, it's essentially a statement that some property of a physical system doesn't change even though the system itself evolves in time. So you know, when you say to someone, off the street, it might sound actually quite boring because when things change in time, we're interested in the way they change in time. We're not interested in what doesn't change in time. Uh, but it really does turn out to be one of the most fundamental notions of physics. Uh, first of all, because they do encompass all of physics, doesn't matter what physical system you're studying, you're going to be faced with these conservation laws. Practically, their existence is what enables us to predict the behavior, the behavior of dynamical systems. So if I have insufficiently many uh, constants of the motion, then essentially my equations of motion will not be integrable. I'm saying essentially because I can't really prove it. It's a very complicated issue. But these two things are definitely uh, related to each other. Um, again, practically, if I know what these conserved quantities are, it really saves me a lot of technical work. So if I'm solving um, ordinary differential equations, then essentially every constant of motion that I know of saves me an integration. It allows me to take shortcuts when I try to understand what my system uh, is doing. And I'll, if time permits, I'll show you an example of that. Now, if I do perform an experiment, and there's this one conservation law that I really very strongly believe in because it's been you know, uh, continuously uh, uh, shown to, to be correct for 100 or 200 years, and I see that it is violated, then either there's a problem with the experiment that I better fix, or maybe this gives me a hold on some new physics. And I think the most famous example with that is when looking at beta decay, this is the ability of a neutron to decay into a proton while emitting an electron. So charge is conserved, the neutron has no charge, the proton has charge plus one, electron minus one, so charge conservation is fine. But when energy was measured, it was always seen that some of the energy was missing. So the energy of the proton plus the energy of the electron was less than the energy of the neutron. And this is what um, caused Pauli, the theoretical physicist, to uh, basically uh, um, uh, suggest that there's another particle that's being generated. This is the neutrino, or the antineutrino, in the way I wrote it here, uh, which eventually, uh, actually not many years afterwards, uh, was, I think not too many years afterwards, uh, was discovered. And thanks to Emmy Netter, which brings me to my third part of the talk, um, the fact that uh, we have these conservation laws really teaches us about the symmetry of nation, nature because of the relation between these two notions. So now I'm going to give you my, you know, 10 minute crash course in classical mechanics. Um, is there anyone here who didn't take any mechanics? Oh, that's an embarrassing question. Um, so let me give the, the crash course and show you how we prove theorems in physics, okay? So Emmy Netter's theorem in the paper itself from 1918, I can't really understand it. But I can understand the modern uh, way in which we look at the theorem, and, uh, and hopefully I'll have enough time to prove, prove it to you. Okay, so how do we do classical mechanics? Um, any physical system, um, I'll 
uh, concentrate on systems with countably or even finite number of degrees of freedom is described by a discrete set of what we call generalized coordinates, which I will label uh, Q sub K. And these are all functions of time. Okay, so K counts the, uh, the degrees of freedom or the coordinates that I use. It turns out that all the information that I need in order to understand the dynamics of my system um, can be uh, written in one scalar function. This is probably one of the <laughs> most amazing things about, uh, about mechanics, uh, which we call the Lagrangian. And it's just the difference between the kinetic energy of my system of particles and the potential energy of my system of particles. Okay, so I need to make some assumptions that all the forces can be derived from a potential energy. So there's some requirements. Um, and, and I ignore here any constraints that I might have between these degrees of freedom. If there are constraints, I have to list them uh, in addition to this Lagrangian. But essentially, this Lagrangian will be now a function of all my coordinates, all their time derivatives, so these are the generalized velocities, and maybe also uh, of time itself. Okay? Um, an important quantity that is defined is the derivative of L with respect to uh, each of the uh, generalized velocities, this is called the momentum, or the conjugate momentum. So to each coordinate, there's a conjugate momentum. And um, if you know a little bit about Legendre transforms, then you see that this kind of derivative is exactly what you need to include in a Legendre transform if you want to convert your function, the Lagrangian, from being a far function of the coordinates and the velocities to, the fun to a function of the coordinates and something else, this something else will be the conjugate momentum. So a, a Legendre transform of this sort gives me what is called the Hamiltonian. And in most cases, not all, oh, there's a condition, in most cases the Hamiltonian is the total energy of my mechanical system. Okay, so this is the background. So how do I determine my equations of motion? This is again, we can uh, uh, talk an hour just about this uh, idea itself um, because it's also quite profound. It says that the physical path taken by a system, which starts with some initial conditions, so the QK at some initial time, and ends at a, at a uh, final state, so the QKs at some final time, is the one for which this particular functional that we write using our paths uh, is stationary. So I can choose infinitely many paths for my system, and what I want to do is I want to take the functional derivative of this action and ask about which path does this functional derivative vanish. So this will be uh, a stationary point of this functional, of this action, and it's often the minimum, so it's often called Hamilton's uh, uh, principle of minimal uh, action. Okay? But the requirement really is stationarity, so the functional derivative of S uh, has to vanish, and then we find um, these so-called Euler-Lagrange equations, which tell us how to determine the equations of motion. There's one equation for every degree of freedom. So we have n-coupled uh, um, uh, differential ordinary differential equations um, um, that are, of course, uh, of, of second order that are, of course, uh, coupled, if I didn't mention. Okay? Now, if I look at this equation, I can all, almost immediately identify conservation laws again, the same way I did from Newton's second law. If I look at this derivative here, then I immediately conclude that if L doesn't depend on QK, so in general it's a function of all the Qs and all the Q dots, but if for some reason QK is missing from L, then dL by dQK dot, its conjugate momentum, P, is going to be conserved. Okay? If this is zero, then the time derivative of this is zero, so this is a conserved quantity. So just by identifying missing coordinates in the Lagrangian, I can immediately write down um, conservation laws. And this already gives me a hint that it's related to symmetry, because if a coordinate is missing, then I can freely change it, do whatever I want to it. Nothing will happen to the equations of motion, because it's not there. Okay, so this, I'm starting to see connections between symmetry and conservation laws. Uh, there's something I will leave you as an exercise to do, but if the Lagrangian is not uh, um, dependent directly on, on time, only through its coordinates and, and, and velocities, so if time is missing from L, then the Hamiltonian, which is most often the energy, is a conserved quantity.
So we can see here already that translation in time, since it's not in the Lagrangian, I don't see that I'm doing it, is somehow related to the conservation of energy. Okay? So um, I wanted to show a problem. When do I need to finish? Ah, ah okay, 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 okay. It's 115. So I thought it was one. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm better than I thought. So I'll work you through a problem, and my students from, you know, uh, from past will excuse me for, for this. So I want to describe the Kepler problem, the mother of all problems, literally. I mean, this is what started it all. This is what caused Newton to develop uh, the mathematics that ne was necessary in order to, uh, to solve this. I'm not sure about Leibniz, what was his motivation. But this is the, really the mother of all problems. Uh, I have two objects uh, in three-dimensional space. So the position of one is given by a three vector R1 and the position of the other by a three vector R2 and the Lagrangian is now the kinetic energy of the first particle that's one half times its mass times the square of its velocity and the second particle and this is the interaction and the Kepler interaction um, um, is the uh, uh, I mean the objects pull each other so it's it's got a minus sign up front but remember that the Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. That's why I have a plus sign here. Um, and instead of writing all the masses in G, I just write a positive constant K up here. Okay? Um, so this is the Lagrangian. This is the system of equations I want to solve. Um, and, and if I use my Euler Lagrange equations, there are six coupled second order differential equations that I need to solve. I'm not going to write them because no one ever writes these equations because no one solves these equations. The first thing you do is you use the conservation of total momentum. And if you use the conservation of total momentum, that basically tells you that you want to describe the system in what is called the frame of reference of the center of mass. Um, so I have this capital RCM. This is the position of the center of mass of my two particles. And a uh, little r here now is the difference between uh, the two vectors here. So I've, I've performed a transformation of coordinates where I see that the center of mass coordinate is missing from my Lagrangian. I see RCM dot, but I don't see RCM in the Lagrangian. It means that the momentum of the center of mass is conserved. Okay, so I'm, I'm going in a circle, but everything is consistent. Um, so if it's conserved, the center of mass is just moving at constant velocity. I can write that as a note on the side. Uh, but can and completely ignore this, th these three equations uh, that will appear. So I'm, I'm looking at now a much simpler Lagrangian, and the next thing I use is the conservation of angular momentum. So let me now write angular momentum with a little l, so we don't confuse it with capital L. Um, and essentially the conservation of angular momentum gives me a very important insight into all of these types of central potential problems, which basically says that all the motion is in a plane. Even though the problem is three-dimensional, its solution lies entirely in a two-dimensional plane, which is normal to the direction of the angular momentum L. So once I go to this plane, I essentially have a Lagrangian now that is uh, uh, basically a function of only two coordinates, depend only on two degrees of freedom. Uh, this is the um, the distance from the origin R and the angle phi. So I've, I've gone to uh, uh, polar coordinates, and this is what I need to solve now. Okay, so we used angular uh, momentum conservation, angular momentum conservation. I have this system, but again, when I look at the Lagrangian, I identify, first of all, that the angle phi is missing. I only have phi dot, I don't have phi. And again, the time is missing here. Okay, so the angle phi is missing implies that it's conjugate momentum is constant. Its conjugate momentum is the angular momentum that we wrote earlier. So we use the fact that the orientation is constant to uh, conclude that the motion is in two-dimensional space. Now we're left with the fact that its magnitude is constant as well um, to reduce the equation for phi from a second-order equation to a first-order equation. And then the fact that the energy is conserved allows me to reduce the equation of motion in R from a second order differential equation to a first order differential equation. So I'm left with two first order differential equations. They can now be solved by quadrature. So that's two integration. And in fact, often what we're interested in is not r as a function of t, 
but of the shape of the orbit. So all we want is r as a function of phi. So it's really one integration, and we have the solution to our problem. But then comes a guy like Laplace, and then years later, two other guys, and realize that there's another conserved uh, quantity in this problem, which is so-called the Laplace vector, or the laplace runge lenz vector. I won't go into the details, uh, but it really is, a, again, some combination of the dynamical variables, the momentum, cross product with the angular momentum, minus uh, something which is essentially the direction of r, so the vector r divided by its magnitude. It turns out that this is a constant of the motion. You can check that it's a constant of the motion. And if you use this, then in one line you solve the radial equation. You don't even have to do a single integration to solve the Kepler problem. Okay? This is the power of conservation laws. And I'm now in the process of trying to explain how and why, finally, they're related to symmetry. So Metra's theorem uh, basically says uh, and I keep saying basically and essentially because I'm not defining things really properly uh, for this kind of audience, so you'll excuse me for that. But it says that a Lagrangian of a physical system, if a Lagrangian of a physical system is invariant under a continuous symmetry transformation, then for each parameter of the transformation, each continuous parameter describing this transformation, there exists a conserved quantity, a so-called constant of motion. Okay, so let me show you how we prove this in a, the most simple context possible. Okay, so the idea is that I have my coordinates. Um, I'm dropping the index k, so think of one degree of freedom, q of k, and I'm performing a continuous transformation on this coordinate which depends on the continuous parameter s. So I'm taking q and by some transformation transforming it into a q which depends on s. Okay, it has s as a parameter and it's a function of time. Okay? Now we, we also make sure that when we perform this transformation, when s equals to zero, it's as if we do nothing. That's the identity transformation. So q of zero and t is just my original coordinate. This is the basic idea. So now the point of the statement of the theorem is that if I take my Lagrangian, this is my original Lagrangian with q and q dot, and wherever I see little q, I replace it by capital Q. Whenever I see little q dot, I replace it with capital Q dot. I algebraically manipulate the outcome and I see that this s vanished from the expressions and I get back my original Lagrangian. Then I say that this operation is a symmetry of the Lagrangian. Okay? Everyone with me? This is the central point of the theorem, understanding what the symmetry means. It basically says that if I take the derivative of L with respect to s, I get zero. So this is a statement that I need to work with. It's a very simple statement. I drop the dependence, the explicit dependence on time here for simplicity. So I have a function of two variables. I need to use the chain rule in order to perform this derivative. So here's the chain rule. And now I do two things. First, I identify dl by dq here. dl by dq, if I look at the Lagrangian as a function of q, and derive the Euler-Lagrange equations for that Lagrangian, then I can replace dl by dq by the other side of the Euler-Lagrange equations, which is d by dt of dl by dq dot. So this is what's written here, and this is essentially the derivative of a product. So I combine that into the derivative of the product, and this is zero because of the symmetry. So I found a quantity which doesn't change in time. This is the point, okay? So now the rest is just some technicality. We say that instead of keeping these cues, this was just something that I used for, the theor for proving the theorem. Um, I want to know uh, how this depends um, at, at my original in, for my original system. So I want to evaluate this uh, quantity, which I now know is conserved in time. I want to evaluate it near the identity transformation near s, near zero, okay? So this is the statement, and at s equals zero, big Q dot becomes little q dot, and dl by dq dot is just the momentum. Okay, so this gives me a very simple, so it's not only a proof, it's a proof, it's a constructive proof. It actually tells me how to calculate this, and this is easily generalized to a system with n degrees of freedom, so I put in my subscript k back in, and a transformation that depends on 
say, d continuous parameters, OK, j going from 1 to d. So I have to sum over um, all my coordinates, and I have d conserved quantities, one for every uh, per continuous parameter describing the transformation. OK, so this is, uh, this is the point. Um, now let's do an example for that, which is somewhat related to the problem that, that I solved. Um, let's say that we have a general Lagrangian, um, now in two dimensions, if you wish, or in three dimensions, I wrote O3, um, which again uh, uh, describes a particle which, is, uh, which feels the, uh, a potential which only depends on its distance from the or origin, okay, a central potential. So this Lagrangian, because this is a dot product, it's a scalar under rotations, and this just depends on the magnitude of the vector, this Lagrangian is invariant under any rotation. So let's, in particular, consider a rotation about the z-axis. So what I want to do is uh, the qk that I have here, I want to identify it with the three coordinates of the position vector r. So I have uh, three coordinates here, x, y, and z. And when I perform the transformation, so the QK of S and T, I want to ident identify that with, uh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. I want to identify that with the rotated vector. So I apply a rotation by an angle theta about the z-axis, it takes x into this combination of x and y, it takes y into this combination of x and y, and it doesn't affect the z-coordinate of the, of the vector. So I just performed a rotation, and now I just need to plug into the equation, that's it. I mean, I have an equation telling me exactly what to do, um, and so uh, the conserved quantity, I have to sum over all the coordinates, but this is like performing a dot product in three-dimensional space, um, I have the components of the momentum, let me use this, I have the components of the momentum P, and then I have to take the derivative of R res with respect to theta and uh, evaluate it at theta equals to zero, okay? So when I take the derivative with respect to theta, the cosines become sines or minus sines, which vanish at zero, the sines become cosines, which turn into one at zero, and so I have a minus Y up here, a plus X here, and a Z down here, which gives me this expression, which is exactly the z component of the angular momentum. Okay, so the prescription gives me exactly the conserved quantity um, that, uh, uh, that is imposed by uh, rotational symmetry, and the same goes, of course, for the x and y components of the angular momentum. Um, okay, so this is angular momentum conservation. Now, there are two important immediate generalization of uh, Netter's theorem, uh, which I uh, want to point out. The first is the fact that when we evaluate the conserved quantity, we're only interested uh, at being very close to s equals zero. So in fact, we don't really require it to be a symmetry transformation of the Lagrangian, or really only want it to be invariant near s equals zero. So if it does affect the Lagrangian, but at higher orders of s, I don't really care about that because I'm going to take the derivative and they're all going to vanish from the expression, okay? So this enlarges the kinds of symmetry. These are often called quasi-symmetries or local symmetries. I'm only interested in operations that are very close uh, to the identity operation. And the second point, which is also important and very, uh, and very useful, is the fact that previously I required the derivative of L with respect to S, again, at S equals zero, to explicitly vanish. And then I determined that this expression was a constant in time. But in fact, I can allow it to be some derivative in time, total time derivative of some arbitrary function. There's no problem with that because then I can just take this G, move it to the left-hand side of the equation, and I just modify the... Uh, um, the uh, expression of, 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 the, of the constant of the motion. So um, I won't explain how and why, but when we add these two generalizations, this is eventually what is needed to make the theorem uh, work also in the opposite direction. So this makes it an if and only if. So if there's a continuous symmetry operation, there's a conserved quantity. If there's a conserved quantity, there's a conserved, there, there is a continuous symmetry operation. And actually, again, there's a prescription of how to generate these symmetry operations uh, because essentially what we have here, these derivatives here are related to the generators of the of the symmetry group, okay? So we can actually generate uh, it in a very practical way.
OK. Um, before finishing, I just want to say a few words about charges and currents, because later on, there's a real talk about how we use Netter's theorem in physics today, in modern physics. Um, and the term charges and currents appears. And we really have to kind of close the circle with the statement that I mentioned earlier, that we know that electric charge is conserved. Is that related to some symmetry of nature? Or is that kind of a different story? And it turns out that it's not a different story. It's the same story. Um, and it is related to the fact that charges are very intimately, very intimately related to the fields that they generate and interact through. Okay, so electric charges generate electromagnetic fields, and that's how they interact with each other. So in order to understand conservation of charge and electric currents, uh, we really need a field theoretic version of Netter's theorem. So I've been describing only discrete systems. Uh, now you have to go to a field theory. I won't go through the details, but maybe in the talk in the afternoon, uh, you will see some of those details. So given any kind of a continuous field, and this is kind of a relativistic notation, so now it depends on time and on space, uh, as opposed to my original coordinates that were discrete and dependent only on time. Uh, what we write is not the Lagrangian, but the Lagrangian density. Um, and then we can actually uh, follow through the same kind of uh, steps exactly, the same Hamilton principle, uh, but now the full Lagrangian is the integral over space of the Lagrangian density, and the action is the integral over time of the Lagrangian. So in fact, the action is the integral over space-time of this uh, Lagrangian density. Okay, so we write the action, and we impose Hamilton's principle, and we get a set of equations, Euler equations, and now I have, whenever I have an index repeated like that, it actually means that there's a sum uh, for all the four values that this index uh, can get. So previously we had just one term here, the derivative with respect to time of the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to velocity. Now we have derivatives with respect to the space coordinates, uh, and here we have the gradients in space of the uh, Lagrangian, uh, sorry, not the gradients in space, but the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the gradients in spe space of the, of the field. Um, and so, again, we have a Lagrangian. Uh, we follow the same kind of sequence of steps that I used in order to prove the simple version of the theorem. And what we end up with is the fact that there are currents. So this is a four-current, a, a, a four-component vector, uh, which satisfy a continuity condition. A continuity condition, name, uh, when I kind of split the time dependence and the spatial dependence from it, says that any local change as a function of time of a certain quantity can come about only due to currents of that quantity leaving that point or coming into that point. So the change in time of rho, which is my charge density, is equal to minus the divergence of j, so how much current I have uh, running, flu uh, running out of that point in space. But I can take this equation and integrate it over space so this is my charge density. That will give me a total density. Uh, if I'm thinking of the system as being confined, then if I go far enough, there are no currents. So this just drops from the integral. And I essentially find that there's a charge that is conserved. Okay? And again, there's an expression which is very similar to the expression we had earlier that we used in order to derive conservation of angular momentum that tells me how to calculate the different components of this current. And if you consider the gauge symmetry of the field and complex fields uh, and, and more generally other kinds of fields like the uh, electromagnetic field has these gauge symmetries, continuous transformations you do uh, that do not affect any of the physics. Uh, these uh, gauge symmetries of the field are those that impose uh, the conservation of charge. And so for the uh, electromagnetic field, we teach these great gauge transformations in the first year of, uh, of physics. Um, and for more complex fields, uh, we kind of la uh, wait later, probably, uh, to the master's degree. So this is all I had to say. I hope I've convinced you, first of all, that both of these issues are really the two probably most central issues in physics. And for this reason, I believe that the theorem that connects the two is probably the most important, definitely the most important theorem in physics, I think, but uh, again, one of the central concepts in physics. Uh, and I'm happy to have had the pleasure to tell you about it.
So all the tough questions uh, should be asked in the afternoon lecture. Uh, beyond standard model uh, network currents and, uh, and charges, I'm looking forward to that. Ah, so in principle, no. Technically, you saw I need to take a derivative with respect to this uh, variable. So for example, mirror reflection symmetry, uh, parity, all these kinds of symmetries that are discrete, uh, there's no Noether theorem. Uh, but you can still say some things about them. And inter interestingly, interestingly, sometimes part of the conserved uh, um, uh, well, let me give you an example, which is better than trying to say it uh, in a general way. When we uh, see that uh, symmetry breaking transition from a liquid to a solid. In the liquid, we had uh, symmetry under any translation in space, and we had conservation of momentum. Now we go from the liquid to the crystal. We've broken that symmetry. We don't have any translation, but we still remain with a discrete set of translations if the crystal is periodic. If the crystal is quasi-periodic, it becomes much more interesting. I'd be happy to tell you about that. That's what I do my research on. Um, but then we go to the periodic crystal where we've broken this symmetry. We only have uh, a discrete set of translational symmetries. And it turns out that some kind of a conservation law still remains. Uh, it's very similar to the conservation of momentum. It basically says that momentum is conserved modulo certain vectors uh, that one can define in momentum space. This, these have to do with the structure of the crystal, okay? And they, uh, they sit on what is called the reciprocal lattice of the crystal, okay? And so momentum is no longer conserved like it was in free space or in the liquid, but it is somewhat conserved, okay? Not exactly, but somewhat. Um, and I don't think, as far as I know, maybe someone can correct it, I don't think there's a theorem uh, that exactly characterizes when something does remain when you break the continuous symmetry or not. But it's a different story here uh, when you've broken the continuous symmetry, definitely. Ah, okay. So uh, this is actually an exercise that uh, every once in a while I give in my classical mechanics class. Uh, it's, it's, it's really ugly. Um, and you really need that generalization, both of the generalizations that I gave to the theory. It's a local symmetry, and it's, it leaves the Lagrangian invariant up to a, a total time derivative of some function. But once you show that, you're free to go. You have the expression, you calculate, and you get this vector. So if you want, I, I can give you the solution to that homework problem. <laughs> Intuitively, what it means, I don't have intuition for that. Uh, but this vector, this Lenz vector, is, uh, or Laplace vector, is a vector that points in the plane of motion of the, uh, of the system. Um, you know that the solutions are essentially ellipses for bound motion. Um, and it basically determines the orientation of the ellipse in the plane. Okay? That's essentially what, and, 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 and it's true, so the, while the thing moves, unless it's affected by uh, general relativity, like Mercury, uh, there's no precession of this uh, uh, or other, other objects that are pulling it from outside. So for the two-body problem, the classical one, uh, the orientation of the ellipse is fixed in the plane. Okay, so other questions from the other room will be offline. Thank you again, Ron.